Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Director Shabtai Shavit to SALT Talks. Uh, Mr. Shavit was the director of the Mossad, which if you didn't know is Israel's intelligence services from 1989 to 1996. Mr. Shavit held a variety of positions within Mossad uh, for over 32 years until becoming the head of the agency in 1989. He served in Sayeret Matkal, I might be butchering the pronunciation of that, Israel's elite force, and received an honorary advanced degree from Harvard University. After retiring from work in the security services, Mr. Shavit was the CEO of Maccabee Health Services for five years. Uh, since 2001, Mr. Shavit has been the chairman of the board of the directors of the International Institute for Counterterrorism, Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, advisor to the Israeli National Security Council, advisor to the Subcommittee on Intelligence of the Knesset, uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs and National Security, and a member of the NYFD Task Force for Future Preparedness Against Terrorism. He's also the author of Head of Mossad in Pursuit of a Safe and Secure Israel, which was published by Notre Dame University Press. And hosting today's talk is Michael Greenwald, who's a director at Tiedemann Advisors, a multifamily office managing over 20 billion in assets. Uh, from 2015 to 2017, Michael was the U.S. Treasury Attaché to Qatar and Kuwait, serving in two U.S. presidential administrations under three Treasury Secretaries, and held counterterrorism and intelligence roles requiring travel to over 20 countries. Uh, in this capacity, he was the principal liaison to the banking sector in Qatar and Kuwait. He was appointed to the U.S. Treasury team that crafted sanctions against Russia, ISIS, and Al-Qaeda. Using his diplomacy background, he serves as a trusted advisor for Tiedemann, uh, managing senior relationships with families and family offices globally. Given his experience with sovereign wealth funds and the private sector in the Middle East, he leads business development in the Middle East for Tiedemann Advisors. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Michael to host the interview. I might pipe in uh, with a couple of follow-up questions here and there, but Michael, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, John, and thank you, Saul Talks, for having us today. And Director, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, I am so happy to be discussing your book, which uh, is a page turner, and it is wonderful to have you again here today. So welcome. I want to begin, Director. You know, more than a hundred thousand Israelis have visited Dubai. Uh, since the Abraham Accords um, have come to fruition, and you're seeing air travel uh, opening up for the first time uh, since last summer. On Friday, the United Arab Emirates announced a $10 billion fund to invest in Israel. And I want to first get your thoughts on what it means that this number of Israelis are traveling to the UAE, and what do you hope this fund to invest in Israel will mean for the future? Director? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, talk to you. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure, especially on these days of the, uh, of the pandemic. It gives you 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 are situated in a in in the end of the world and you and you are talking live with uh, the other end of the world, which uh, gives you a <laughs> feeling of <laughs> being free. Uh, well, the uh, um, I I I, uh, I really consider the Abraham uh, um, agreements as a. Uh, as a, as a maybe unique opportunity for a window of opportunity to uh, to uh, bring to the Middle East large a new era of uh, stability instead of uh, wars and skirmishes and terrorism and a never-ending uh, conflict between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. 
and um, what connects people. And uh, the best recipe for uh, healing uh, conflicts is uh, um, economic uh, interests. And uh, here, in spite of all uh, all what uh, happened in the uh, has happened in the uh, in the Middle East in, in the last few decades, I I uh, I, I really do uh, um, see an, an an opening to to change it. But of course, it's a it's a matter of uh, a um, relatively long period of time, and it needs uh, um, a few. Uh, Preconditions to uh, uh, to be uh, met, uh, but but by and large it is it is feasible. And and the and the uh, what what we have as a society, as people, as uh, as nations to to win is uh, makes makes it very deserve, very deserved to uh, to invest the uh, all the effort which is which is needed. So. Um, the main, uh, <clears throat> the main common denominator between us, um, the Arab countries, most of them, especially the, the Sunni countries in the Middle East. Uh, but we need for it to happen. We need the uh, leadership of of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, and the. Uh, I believe that the change of guard in in, in the US uh, in the US also gives us uh, the opportunity to uh, to be successful uh, and uh, what's needed from uh, from the uh, uh, present president is to uh, to change a little bit the uh, former policy of America first and uh, let's disengage from the world and uh, and and deal only with domestic, with American domestic, domestic uh, 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 issues. Now, uh, the Middle East is uh, is uh, here since the beginning of time, and of and, and one of its char characteristics is that all along history it was considered to be a an area, a region, uh, which which uh, stability is not uh, one of its uh, icons and and, and symbols. And uh, you know anybody who, who anybody who believes that he can uh, leave the uh, Middle East and don't pay attention to it, uh, based on my uh, humble experience, uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, it is not a vision that uh, can uh, can uh, become uh, true. Um, we have a saying that uh, um, you may neglect the Middle East, but uh, the Middle East would never neglect you. So uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an issue that uh, there are two, uh, two parties to this, uh, to this tango. So uh, that's why I, 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 I do believe that uh, the United States has the, has the leading power of uh, the free world uh, will uh, Will uh, will will be connected and will uh, invest uh, time and and sources and resources um, to the Middle East and and now we do have a, a new opening with a very with a very good uh, a, 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 um, a hope to uh, to be successful. So uh, to put it very uh, very shortly. What I uh, what I see is a new axis of power uh, being built in the in the Middle East, which will include first of all the U.S. as as the leading uh, partner, and then the uh, uh, three countries: Israel, Egypt, and Jordan. The three which uh, that um, already has have a uh, peace treaties. Uh, since uh, quite a long time, and then the uh, the Emirates who uh, joined the uh, the uh, Abraham uh, Accords, and I also see Saudi Arabia as a major power 
that uh, should be uh, uh, a partner in 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 this uh, in this uh, axis. Now, this this axis um, will uh, will uh, transmit to the rest of the world the following measure, the following message which says that the us is is not disengaging from from the middle east the us is uh, um, going to play a major role in the in the middle east and uh, the message will be uh, will be targeted first of all to china on the on the global level to russia on the global level um, a signal to them that listen we are not uh, uh, going out from the from the playground and uh, then on the regional uh, on the regional level it will it will send a very strong message to iran and to turkey iran is uh, is galloping toward the uh, acquiring a, a military nuclear capability with a military surface to surface uh, nuclear missiles and the uh, turkey is undergoing a a a, a, um, a, a sort of a, uh, a, 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 a becoming again a, a, a um, religious right. called the Sharia Islamic Sharia and they uh, and they cooperate and support uh, some of the uh, most extreme uh, Muslim uh, terrorist uh, organizations so this new axis will uh, will be a buffer all also vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Turkey who are that which be, which are considered to be a regional powers and they uh, at the end of this uh, this uh, process it will uh, bring hopefully peace between uh, Israel and the Palestinians because uh, if the uh, this axis will be engaged in uh, in in enhancing the idea of of the peace and um, and and the Saudi Arabia will will be a participant in in it and in order in order for them to to join, uh, we'll have to, uh, all parties will have to uh, base the uh, uh, negotiation uh, draft on the Saudi or the Arab League, League uh, proposal from uh, back uh, 2003. And uh, I, I don't see either side, not the Palestinians and not the uh, Right. Israel, Israeli, whatever government it may have, to uh, to uh, refrain or to be to, to be opposed to such a proposal. So, building on that, director, and I think you mentioned China and obviously many of the Gulf states. Israel has played an, a unique intermediary role for years, and some would say that the role that Israel has played with. Uh, weaponizing its uh, cyber capabilities in its own Silicon Valley and what it's been able to have a relationship strategically with the Gulf states and China and others, that its intermediary role has been very unique. At the same time, uh, n a number of the Gulf states have played a key intermediary role with China. How do you see what the Gulf states um, can learn from Israel? And what can Israel learn from the Gulf states? And in your book, Director, you spent time in Southern Iran in the early 70s. What do you think Israel can learn from Iran? From, 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 Iran, from? from Iran. From Iran. Well, the <laughs> I'm smiling because the first, uh, Answer so that that comes to my mind is uh, is uh, um, wall stalling uh, and uh, and playing for time and uh, by playing. That, uh, I mean, obviously, we know the Iranians are excellent negotiators. Yeah, uh, they 
they they have, they have invented this uh, this art you know i uh, i i've learned some of my farsi in the bazaar and the, the art of negotiation started in the bazaar it is an iranian it is an iranian invention and uh, you know uh, imagining a room where uh, where around the table you have a group of americans negotiator and <laughs> a group of persian negotiators uh, i don't have any doubt whatsoever who's going to uh, to warn the other um so this is the this is the uh, this is the first uh, the first thing that i learned another thing that i learned and it was it was right those years at the uh, mid 60s um that uh, yeah, you know in order to in order to uh, you, you don't need protection if you have if you have connections in uh, in in iran and uh, if i can uh, if i can uh, steal from our time uh, two minutes i'll try to give you a, a vignette from those days um uh, a persian a, a, an iranian an iranian partner of mine those years told me one morning you know i i'm going to the bazaar to buy uh, to buy cloth uh, 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 for uh, for a suit uh, you want to join me and i uh, i joined him so we went to the shop we entered the shop uh, the uh, the guy in the shop didn't uh, didn't know who we were and we started to uh, to measure and to ask and to about cloth and so on and so forth all of a sudden the telephone in the uh, shop rang and the uh, shop owner go, uh, went and uh, took the uh, telephone and uh, after a uh, 30 seconds he turned to us and uh, he told us uh, are you mr so and so the uh, the uh, 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 governor of uh, of the region uh, wants you and uh, my partner the iranian partner took the t- took the phone and talked for a uh, five six seven minutes um, he finished every every sentence that he said by the words yes tim sar no tim tim sar in farsi is general and uh, then he uh, he finished the uh, the uh, telephone call and uh, then we bought what we bought and when, when it came to uh, paying the uh, <laughs> the shop owner refused to uh, to receive money from us and it was but why we had connections the uh, the <laughs> governor of the of the region called us when we went out my counterpart told me the telephone came from my wife so he talked with he was discussing with his, his wife as if she were the uh, secretary of the uh, governor of the so it's it's a very colorful story but uh, it tells you what uh, the, the, the the what's behind it in in culture in uh, in dna in uh, so and so forth so uh these are the basic yeah, no, that, things that, that that crystallizes i think the art of negotiation and yeah. you know i hope that uh the israelis uh, and the iranians can maybe at one point go to the tailor uh, together again i want to build on israel's relationship with china and i know that you dealt with the chinese at different levels when you were director and before at masad Where do you see the relationship with China going right now? It's a very sensitive issue here in the United States. The previous administration pressured uh, you know, the prime minister and the government on how close the ties should be. Where do you think is the happy medium for Israel to have a strategic relationship with China, but also maintain and grow the strategic relationship with the United States without putting the relationship with China uh, out of bounds and doing things that would potentially hurt the United States. Well, uh, let me let me tell you the following and of course I express myself only I don't 
represent nobody and no one of the uh, of the organizations that I uh, used to uh, to belong in in in, in the past in the past. Um, I believe that I I I I would rephrase your 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 uh, question or the, the answer to your question that we should define and cut out our the nature of our relationship with China from our relationship with the US meaning basically that between the two I don't have any doubt and I and I think that nobody should have any doubt to whom to give the preference there is no doubt that we should uh, this, the, the, define and build the relationship between us and the and the uh, U.S. and to come to a sort of an understanding to what extent we it would be acceptable for for the U.S. Uh, that we uh, that we uh, build, on the other hand, some relationship with the with the Chinese, because uh, um, relationship with Israel with uh, between uh, the U.S. and Israel go back uh, for uh, so many years. A, um, the U.S. was the first uh, the first uh, country in in the U.N. to support the. Uh, Inception and the, the the establishment of the state of Israel, a relationship between Israel and the and the United States are based not only on pure interests, but uh, on 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 the heritage of 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 uh, the Jewish uh, uh, culture and, uh, and 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 the Bible and so on and so forth, and the uh, and the U.S. Uh, Oftentimes, um, declare that uh, the the security and the survival of Israel as a as an independent country is one of the uh, one of the uh, pillars of of the American foreign policy. Whereas with China, we we do have a relationship that um, it's nice to have, but uh, uh, those relationships. Uh, when it comes to uh, to real survival, um, we Israel we cannot uh, we cannot rely on them. So uh, this is the balance, and according to this balance, we should uh, design and and execute our uh, relationship with them. So, director, before I turn to how Israel has utilized uh, the COVID vaccine for its strategic influence, there was a part of your book that really. Um, spoke to me, as well as other people that have worked in uh, professions of service and of, and professions profession. of service. And ah. you, you, you mentioned in your book, um, dealing with the eulogies um, of uh, some of the members of Mossad that had died in service. And it was interesting that you included those eulogies, um, you know, written over the years. And so can you just maybe talk to us about why you included that part in your book and what it means to you when you read them about service and being away from your family during that time period that was very tumultuous. Um, look, uh, um, the the basic logic of service in 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 Israel and especially in <clears throat> in the uh, different security organizations uh, starting with the IDF and and then the uh, security service and, and Mossad is uh, is based on the notion that uh, we people who serve the the country 
do it voluntarily, first of all. They don't did it for living. I can, uh, just in brackets, 32 years, believe me, I didn't know the amount of money that uh, entered my bank account uh, as, as, as my salary. When I wanted anything about it, it was connected with money, I, I, uh, I, I, talked, to my, I talked to my wife. So, um, and the, uh, the feeling of a, a, an independent war that unfortunately never, never ends. You know, we, well now we are 72 years, we are 72 years since, since independent. Uh, there was no one decade without any uh, without any um, uh, encounter be uh, be uh, between us and and our neighbors, some of our neighbors, and uh, then uh, with the uh, terrorist organizations. And uh, there is no day passing by without a casualty here or uh, or, or an, a terrorist attack there. So the the our DNA is the DNA of of people. Who are uh, who are recruited uh, for for the long of their life, and they, uh, this is maybe um, the 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 uniqueness about our situation as compared to uh, as compared to other other country around the world, and uh, this is also the reason why. You are you are talking with me, and uh, I'm now uh, I'm 82 years old, uh, and uh, you sit and talk to somebody who who would pay a fortune in order to achieve uh, in order to achieve peace, and uh, and to live and to live the Israel uh, at peace with its neighbors for for my kids and grandchildren. So I want to build on that because my next question was about your grandchildren. Um, did you feel you were, given your role and given the difficult areas you were tackling, did you feel as present in the lives of your children? Are you making up for that now in the lives of your grandchildren? And when, what are you hoping that when your grandchildren tell their children about you how do you want them to describe you? What stories do you want your grandchildren to tell their children uh, about their grandfather? You know, I am. I am a. Uh, um, I am a great believer in 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 uh, in in the equation that. Charisma is being uh, is being uh, uh, expressed by deeds and uh, not by stories. So, uh, because of this uh, uh, definition, I um, I've rarely uh, discussed uh, uh, things about uh, about this uh, this issue like uh, any other issues. Uh, just to tell you in brackets that. The uh, the event when the prime minister uh, nominated me to uh, to the uh, to the job there was a small modest event with with the big, all the big shots of the country. A, uh, I thought that it was a, an opportunity for me to uh, to say something about my uh, how I see the world, how I see the threat, what. How I th I believe that we should uh, address uh, our problems, and um, I was standing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the prime minister, who was the late Itzhak Shamir, and um, we, um, it was very, very, very near to each other. It's all of a sudden I saw him bending to the guy who stood uh, side to him, and he told him, "Hey, listen, I didn't know the chapter I know knows to speak at all." <laughs> <laughs> so, a, uh, I, 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 uh, 
I'm happy that whenever I, I, I remember it. Uh, my, my kids, without me preaching, without me saying, without my kids, six of them, three already finished the army, they, their compulsor, compu compulsory service, and three are now in the uh, army. All of them, I don't know why. I didn't use any connection, but all of them are, are serving in, a, in, in elite units. Uh, they didn't learn it at school. They didn't. Uh, they, they they were not uh, 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 led to. Uh, but uh, this is the nature, uh, the kind of life that you that you lead, which uh, at the end of the day influence you your siblings more than anything else. So, Director, I want to turn to COVID and how Israel has tackled it, because I think Israel has played a very important role in how it's used Mossad to first, um, you know, create control and order in the country, and then obviously to create its own sense of urgency uh, to create uh, buying up vaccines, working with uh, different parts of the country. Uh, and so it's really being seen as a model. Uh, how do you, why do you think Mossad got involved with, the, with COVID in this capacity? And how do you see Israel being talked about 20 years from now? Was this an inflection point for Israel coupled with the Abraham Accords to really blossom in a different economic way than it ever has before. Look, uh, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting question, but uh, but uh, I know uh, I'm sure that some people who would uh, listen to us now are not going to like my uh, answer to that question. <laughs> Looking at it <laughs> in retrospect. Uh, it it uh, believe me it served the purpose of 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 a gimmick to to some people without uh, naming names uh judging it by the results believe me the uh, the operation in which uh, the mossad brought the uh, nuclear uh, a, 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 a store book with uh, with all the uh, Millions of of documents of the uh, of the new of the Iranian nuclear technology. I'm sure that 20 years from now, no one will remember that the Mossad was engaged to buy a, a, a vaccines and and these kind of things. But everybody would remember the uh, the operation that. Uh, dealt with the Iranian nuclear uh, project. So I want to turn to your thoughts on whether another Arab Spring could brew among some Arab states. Do you think we're headed for a second round? Do you see the uh, another type of geopolitical earthquake happening of uprisings? Um, and if not, why do you think that wouldn't take place? First of all, it took place at the beginning of the, the uh, 2010, and, and hence it took place because because the uh, and I'm I, I'm talking bullets now uh, because the young generation in in the Arab countries um, underwent a sort of a uh, intellectual revolution and uh, and decided that it was time for the Arab countries who uh, were mostly totalitarian kind of countries to uh, to change and to uh, and to introduce uh, to the Middle East a uh, democracy and and uh, so democracy and uh, and a uh, uh, um, <clears throat> liberal economy and freedom and so on and so forth. But 
it turned out that they didn't succeed because the result of the spring revolutions in the Middle East brought in extreme Islam instead of democracy. And in order to beat the uh, extreme Islam, we had, we, we had the, uh, the uh, different uh, yeah, revolutions uh, with the involvement of, uh, of uh, part of the world. Um, terrorism itself expanded and uh, covers now all the world. And the, uh, the uh, extreme terrorism, which is based on, on religious, on, on religion, makes the, uh, the, the, the confrontation and the, and the problem even more difficult because of the nature of, of this kind of Islam being, being, being religion, religious and uh, yeah, uh, 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 one gentleman who one mullah or an ayatullah can determine the, uh, the, 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 the future of a country or the future of the world. Um, it's interesting that uh, the only one countries who, who, who moved past the um, spring revolution safely were the monarchies. It was Jordan and Morocco and the uh, and to 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 said the monarchies in the in the in, in the Gulf they uh, they cross this uh, this era relatively relatively well. Now, I my it's not a feeling; it's an assessment. Is the that the young generation who who uh, started it back in uh, in in two thousand and ten they still are around. And the generation um, behind are there, and and the urge for for changing the 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 Middle East to become a better Middle East, economically, socially, politically, and so on and so forth, is 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 still there. So I don't rule out the. Uh, the possibility that uh, um, certain conditions um, cross each other in a in a given time, and we may uh, we may see a, a, a second chapter of uh, of of this uh, right trial. So I have two more questions for you, Director. One, you talked about you going into the tailor with your Iranian counterpart, and given what this administration in the United States is about to undertake with future negotiations with Iran and what Secretary of State Blinken is forming his team. How would you advise the United States administration from a negotiation perspective? What tactics, what areas of strength, how do you see the United States coming to the table from more of a position of strength how can they exit the tailor not having to pay for their suits? Look, the, uh, the long speech that I uh, gave you at the, uh, at the outset of our meeting, if, if, if this um, speech becomes the strategy of the American foreign, of foreign policy, this alone will affect the, 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 uh, 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 the, 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 the mind position and the, and the uh, uh, strategy that the Iranians will, will shape in order, to, in order to, uh, to start their negotiations around the table. Now, uh, because if Iran realizes that not only the U.S. as the number one superpower in the world is staying in the Middle East, but rather it succeeds 
to build a uh, very big coalition, and especially a coalition where Arab countries and Israel are participating. Um, the Iranians are not stupid. They are, they are very smart. And it, it will, it will, uh, um, it will indicate to them that uh, this coalition mean, means business. And it is not only the United States that negotiate with them. It's the uh, big part, big, uh, the bigger part of the Middle East and the uh, Europeans. And uh, they'll, uh, they, it, it may affect their, uh, their demands and their uh, vision and, and so on and so forth. Now, now, just to add to this, to be more more practical, you know the uh, the 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 existing uh, treaty, uh, introducing to it uh, a few addition uh, demands or requests or call it whatever you like to call, but uh, one that uh, 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 demands as regards to the uh, what uh, experts call the the sunset of of the of the uh, uh, agreement, uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, nuclear surface to surface missiles, which was not dealt with entirely with in the in the existing uh, contract, and also uh, the issue of uh, Iranians mingling all over the Middle East and uh, and and causing uh, troubles and um, havoc. So if 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 the West with the, the US succeed to deal with this, maybe one or two additional uh, uh, points that I don't recall at the moment, and succeed to extract from the uh, Iranians. Um, agreement on this issue, it could give us a, um, another generation of uh, relative peace. So, Director, I want to ask you one last question before I turn it back to John, and that's if, if the Prime Minister asked you tomorrow to create a Passover Seder table, which countries besides the United States, would you have at that table during that Seder and why? So what countries are most important to Israel going forward besides the United States? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. I never thought about uh, about it, I, we just uh, we just got the news last night that uh, we are going to have a regular seder without any restrictions from the government <laughs> because of the because of the corona. Uh, I, I, it will sound odd to you what I'm going to tell what I'm going to say, but. If it if it was possible, I would invite, in addition of the Americans, I would invite the Chinese. Do you think they would like brisket and matzo ball soup? I uh, what I can tell you from my uh, personal experience is that uh, the the Chinese uh, think only good things about us. Uh, in 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 various issues, they even envy us. Again, I can uh, I can give you another vignette. Um, uh, when when I used to visit after making the round of meetings, and I, I uh, during my term I uh, I visited uh, three four times a year there, and they would reciprocate. So after finishing the, the the round of meetings with my counterparts, they took me to a to a, a person 
was the number three on the Politburo a, uh, ladder. He had three heads. He was the coordinator of all security services. He was the chairman of the uh, uh, nation's uh, parliament, so to say. It's, um, they have this body, uh, very small, 6,000 members of, and he was the chairman of this body. And the third, he was the third, number three on the, on the Politburo list. And in the, each time during the first meetings, the three, four meetings, at a certain point of time, he used to, uh, to push the, uh, the, uh, the question, tell me who's older? Remind me who's older, you or us? And historically, they are older. You can't help it. <laughs> so I had to, I had to tell him, "You are older than we are." And then I thought, "What, what, what should I do? What can I do?" And uh, it was the first or fifth meeting with him. I waited for him to drop the uh, to to uh, to to push the uh, the question. And when he did, I told him, "Listen, we have another calendar than you." Our calendar is the weight of of uh, the brains, and not the uh, <laughs> and not the regular calendar of yours. Since then, he never he never asked the question again. <laughs> well, director, I uh, I look forward to having Passover Seder with you. You are always welcome, and I look forward to that very much. I want to thank you so much for this wonderful conversation today. Uh, for this fantastic book, which I recommend everyone to go out and read. And John, I want to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. And see you around. Well, Director Shavit, it was a pleasure to have you here on Salt Talks. And Michael, thank you so much for moderating today's conversation and look forward to having you again on Salt Talks uh, to talk about a lot of the things that you've worked on and continue to work on over at Tiedemann. And I love reading all of your articles that you send through uh, to your mailing list. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, both of you. Just a reminder uh, for anybody who missed any part of this Salt Talk or any of our previous Salt Talks, all these Salt Talks are available on our website and on our YouTube channel. Salt.org backslash talks is the website. Our YouTube channel is called Salt2. We've made all these uh, webinars free during COVID to just try to educate people on a variety of things going on in the world. So we've really enjoyed that. We're also on social media. On Twitter is where we're most active at SALT Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And please spread the word about these SALT Talks. But on behalf of the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off for today. We hope to see you back here soon.